That is now working. Mike Labriola. <laughs> All right, so welcome, first of all, and again, uh, thank you for the space, I appreciate it. Um, so, I have this tendency to do dumb things to myself, um, and one of them is to pick a topic like debug tools and very general phase when like Joe reaches out and says he needs a topic, and then to only later realize that it's kind of a big topic, even though it small, sounds like a small thing, because, you know, it encompasses everything from performance profiling and logging and APIs and memory and consumption and how things go. So I kind of was thinking about what I wanted to accomplish today and I realized that they're only going to let me talk for so long before they make me leave. So um, instead, what I thought we would do is we'll do a little bit of a survey that's going to start pretty light, but maybe some things that you don't know, some things on the logging API, some pieces that are pretty interesting that actually make debugging a little more effective. We'll get into the debugger, we'll show some tricks with debugging a little bit, and then we'll kind of escalate up, depending on where we go, into some memory stuff. So, um, who's used the Chrome debugging tools? Good. Who knows what generational garbage collection is? Okay, cool. So, we're going to cover that area uh, in between those two points. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll take a little bit of time in between. I want to show a little bit of stuff that's very practical on the debugging, and then I want to take a step back because I was trying to write something on showing you more memory um, and garbage collection pieces, and then I realized that without a little bit of understanding about what's going on, none of the terms make any sense. So we'll take a little bit of time, we'll step back, we'll actually talk about how garbage collection works in these sorts of virtual machines, and then once we understand that, we'll come back in and we'll actually look at a little bit of, of working around with the computer uh, profiler. Sound good to everybody? All right. So let us get started. Um, we'll start basic. There you go. That felt good. All right, we're ready now. Um, so we're going to start basic, and we're just going to go through a few pieces here uh, on things I want to show. So as a starting point, um, I hope everybody's good with this, but we'll, uh, we'll go here. We're going to have our little web page that we're going to work with to do some fun things, and we're going to go into the debugger. Now, there's a really rich API um, council debugging in Chrome in particular. Um, that can show us a lot of things, and we're able to do quite a bit with it. And the reason that this is so important, well, there's twofold, first of all. Many people really still debug everything by council, um, which is problematic, uh, because there's a lot better tools available to us. But if we are going to use the council, we should at least understand the APIs well enough to do everything we can with it really effectively, right, and, and, and accomplish a lot. So we're going to start with the basics of just logging something out, and then we're going to just sort of evolve it, because there's actually a pretty rich API. Like, 30, 40 methods to the uh, Chrome Council API. Um, and I think almost everybody uses log, um, which, is, which is a little bit of a shame considering everything it could do. <clears throat> All right, so we have a really interesting example where we click a button and it logs something. Not applause right now, but if you feel like it, I'm here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. All right, I did it. I, I had an event listener. I was able to log something out successfully. Um, and it was quite handy. Uh, there is, there's my code in case anybody wants to see it. Okay. Now, some of the things that uh, I watch uh, developers do, and um, some of these people are, are in the room, so I'm only addressing uh, you, Kyle. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, some of the th things I watch people do are go through and do work that they don't have to do if they understood the APIs. So I want to show some of those. One of the first ones and one of the options in the console APIs that you can do in Chrome is to show timestamps. Um, so that instead of watching my developers go back and recompile a big app in order to add uh, new date time that get time to everything and console log it out, you should know that you can probably turn on timestamps anytime you want to to be able to see <laughs> the difference in between when two things happen. And we're going to see a lot more of that in a moment. Uh, but that is one of the first things that we need to do. Um, I feel bad. Kyle came all the way out here. And I'm sorry. I, I've never even done that. I, I, <laughs> Kyle, you understand from work that this yeah, doesn't matter if you've actually done it, right? Yep, I know. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have now. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. now forevermore in a recording, it has been immortalized. Yeah. Like Kyle's done it. All right. all right. So some of the other things that we can do, which are kind of interesting and important, um, is that we can preserve requests. So we have this ability to preserve a log request. And what that means right now is that as we're doing things, even if we refresh the page, our log doesn't go away. And this is really important when we're trying to compare and contrast things over time, because we want to actually be able to see the difference between two different runs of things. It's going to be very important to be able to preserve that data instead of copy it off and try to compare it somewhere else in another program. So comparing it's really interesting. Now this will get more interesting as we go along, 
But we have the ability to filter any of these things in the log. So as we start typing, we will see things that um, disappear as we go along because we can filter that log actively. Okay? Now that gets more interesting if we start beginning to expand our API a little beyond just doing log, okay, console.log. In fact, we could actually go quite a bit further here. So we can do console log, and let's actually just throw a couple in here for a moment. Oh, one thing, sorry, I should have mentioned. At any given point, not only can we filter it, but we can save it. Okay, so one of the things that we can actually do, which is incredibly helpful, by the way, I, I hate when I see this, but when there is something like a race condition or a timing condition, if you have appropriate logging, it's incredibly effective to save off a log from one session and a log from another, and just do a simple text diff. Um, to see the difference between them and see what actually just happened. Um, so saving that log is actually a really, really valuable thing that you can do. Okay, so let's go back in. So we have our console log and that's fine. We can also do a number of other things like console.debug, okay? We'll do that. Actually, let's just keep them all log click for right now. And as long as we're at it, we can do console.info, console.warn, Cancel that error. All right, so <coughs> we go in here, we click it. Oh, I guess I can turn off preserve log now. You guys understand that feature, right? And I click it, we get the various incarnations of this, which is really quite helpful, but it's even better when we start combining them with some of the different filtering and sorting that we have the capability of doing. Because we can come over here and we can actually say, that we're only actually interested in seeing info warnings or errors, or if we turn on verbose, we actually get the debug ones as well. So we have the capability if we begin to, to um, filter down what we're doing in the application and really see something other than log, we can start seeing some of what's actually happening um, in terms of, of, of filtering. Additionally, warnings and errors will actually give us a bit more information about where they actually occurred and allow us to go into that line of code. There's another little used menu over here, which I think is kind of neat, which will actually show us in the course of a session exactly what we happened. So we have seven messages. We have, and there's a couple of these because it's Firebase, but we'll talk about that later. Um, we won't talk about that later. You'll have to trust me. Um, user messages, errors, warnings, verbose. We can actually filter out a little bit about what we're doing over here and navigate through the app to see when things happened and where they were. Is that per log session or per navigation? It is per log session unless you, but that so can be log and log. Right, precisely. Okay. <clears throat> All right, as we go along. So this can be really useful as a way to start things and to keep track of what's actually happening inside of the sort of logging environment um, and, and what we're trying to do. So uh, the, oh, I mentioned filtering obviously and within the warnings and levels, which is really good. But one of the other cool things, and let's do, we'll have to make an object in order to do this real quick. Uh, instead of just logging, let's go ahead and, <coughs> so we're doing a string, let's log out an object. So we're going to log out E. Now, although we're actually going to talk about where this is a really big problem later, um, we can log out an event or an entire type of object. And the interesting thing within Chrome's bugger is once we've done so, we can actually interact with that object. Uh, word of warning, in case we don't happen to get to it, this is your, I'll save you like four hours of hunting down a memory leak uh, that I've spent personally. Um, when you log out an object, it can't get garbage collected and it stays in memory because it's in the console. So if you try to actually log out an object and then figure out why it doesn't go away in memory, the answer is you're dumb and did it to yourself. Um, Kyle. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> so, this one was me. Um, so the, uh, but to be able to interact with objects is actually pretty cool, and in fact we'll see in a moment that you can do a lot more than just that. But if I can interact with objects um, in the console, uh, I have the beginnings of something that, that can kind of be interesting in how I build stuff up, right? So I have an object that's out here, and I say that's great. You know what I'd really like to do though? <coughs> I want to do some comparison or I want to get to some other area in the application, because I've logged it out, I can store it as a global variable. And so now the moment I've stored that as a global variable, I can actually take that and I can reference it again anywhere else in the code. So if I wanted to do some type of comparison, I can get back to that same variable again. And if I get really kind of crazy with some of these things, which is kind of fun, 
I can do things like json.stringify, well, not if you type, type it all, otherwise it's just json.str. Um, it won't let you Yeah, I know. <laughs> there. Well, it's not that it won't. You have to use the right arrow to autocomplete, and there's just something <laughs> right. built into the yeah. response mechanism of my hand that assumes that enter is autocomplete. Yeah. And before my brain can stop me from pressing it, every single time I press enter, and then I start typing it again, and I press enter, and 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 and. and. Okay. So anyway, we can actually do things like uh, stringify out JSON if we wanted to, in order to be able to um, do other things, which is really kind of interesting. Now, wait a minute. But it's really kind of interesting if you get to the point of being able to store logs um, in log files as well. All right. So. Let us um, console.clear is a way that we can clear it. We can also clear it with the handy one button in the upper left hand corner. Okay, that's fine. That's our gentle beginning, okay? We're going to do a little bit more here, uh, and we'll start with this. Yes, Kyle! It's also worth noting that, no, it's not. <laughs> if you, if in the process of debugging something, that object in the console is modified in yep. any way, they will all be modified because it is the same reference. So yeah, so, I mean, I'm not saying that was obvious to everyone else here, know, maybe, but yeah. um, so yes, yes that is support. actually, so that is a really interesting point though. When you log, and that was Conus Electronic Garbage Collection point. When you log out that object in the console, it's showing you, but it's basically the console's holding onto that object and it's showing you that real object. If you modify it, it modifies. If you change it somewhere else, it changes. So it's not a copy. Unless you do it yourself, you really are interacting with a real object somewhere in memory, okay? Uh, which is very, very powerful um, in the things that you can do. But do keep in mind, as uh, I understood from Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. It's very important. I have pizza on my shirt. OK. Um, so well, we got some things that we're logging out here, right? So we're just doing some foo logging out, and that's all cool. We'll put that over there. Um, and that obviously interacts with the filter, because I can actually start looking at things like more or things that I want, which is cool. Um, but this is, especially as an application goes along, gets really kind of big and bulky to be able to understand where things got logged out. So Chrome actually, we already know, uh, some of you may already know, um, collapses things. So in other words, if I were to come in here and I were to do this, and I were to run that code, Chrome doesn't actually tend to, oh, does, yeah, well, if you do it that way, it does. Um, Chrome tends to be exactly the opposite of what I meant to say and do it at any time. But we can actually log out and we can count the number of operations we do. What's interesting though is that we can force groups to occur so that we can understand when something happened. So there's this idea of council.group and we give it the name of a group. So this is a little weird at first because um, it may be, uh, the first time I used it at least, I assumed that I was going to put a message in which was going to start the beginning and end, but this actually defines a group, okay? And so I can define a group here, and I can say console.groupn, and in doing so, if I run foo and foo, I actually will get something, you have to click the right button though, that'll glue things together, so that I can kind of say what sub area of the application. It is based on execution order. Yeah. So it's yep. Old school. Yeah, it is very old school. <laughs> All right, so in addition to group, there's group, but as you can imagine, if you had, I don't know, 40,000 of these or something, it could get a little intense. So one of the things that you can do, which is pretty cool, and you may have seen it in auto while I was doing this, is a group collapsed. You just starts out in a collapse form, and then you're... of IE. Holy crap. <laughs> but only if the debug game is not open. Right. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> just an IE, not the actual. Right, 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 right. Yes. <laughs> but yes, for those of you who don't know, if you ever want to really infuriate yourself, if you use counsel, counsel is when the debug plane is open. When the debug pane is closed, counsel is no longer defined. So therefore, the line of code crashes. You open the debug counsel, it works. You close the debug counsel, it crashes. You open the debug counsel, it works. You close the debug counsel, it crashes. You open the debug counsel, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, uh, it's a handy little thing they decided to do for us. It was very nice. OK, so in addition to that, uh, one of the things that actually is kind of fun too is all of these things, and I've skipped past it for the most part, but all of these allow forms of text replacement to act in the council. Now, why this is important mm -hmm. is that I watch people construct mm -hmm. up these big things and things that we're adding code to our project, but the council log statement can actually do that by itself already. It says it's home. So rather than type it, I put a little version of it down here. But if we go through and grab something like this, We'll get rid of our group stuff for right now. We can actually take a council statement. Come here. And we can log. The thing I clicked was, and we can specify that we want a string. This is like old school printf. Um, and we can specify the node name, or we can specify a string. We can specify replacements. The full list of things that we can actually specify in this context, and actually just to see what we're talking about, what I mean is this. Reference error ease. Oh, well. Turns out, if you want to do this, you should probably have it in an event handler. Not a pro tip, actually. There you go. So there you go. All right. So in this case, we're logging out something that was composed at runtime, right, as opposed to actually uh, trying to build a string that we're then going to log out. The full list of things that we can actually do with this is right down here. It's as um, So. What we can do is we can do strings, we can do uh, digits, which is the same as an integer, okay? We can do floating points, we can do objects, we can also do DOM objects, and we can do CSS classes, okay? And any of those will come out and be expandable in line with your string um, as far as things that you'd like to be able to, to kind of build out. So it's actually pretty neat um, in terms of, of being able to, to make a pretty functional, let's try it. Live coding is always, always scary. There you go. Okay. So, um, but you can always uh, you can build things out on the fly. So it's actually pretty interesting the way that it works. Um, the difference being, if you don't specify one of those things, especially object or object, and you are concat or building a string, Chrome's going to convert it by calling its two string method. So in this case, if you console log something that is an object by itself with no other components, it will log out the object. If you concatenate it together with a string, it's going to log out a string. If you use this with these partitioned pieces, you can actually get combinations of strings and objects and things that actually interplay together. So okay. Very different from a string template. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's not. It's not a string literal in that, or a string template literal, um, in that case. So, so you can see we actually have an object here that, at the end of our line, we're able to log out. Okay. So pretty interesting stuff, actually, in terms of what you can what you can do and how you can build on it in order to, uh, to produce something that is is pretty viable log output. Okay, let's go over here. Now, um, these get more interesting. Uh, oh yeah, I like this one. This one's actually a little more known, but I really like it and it's really freaking useful. So I can start out with something that is just some JSON, right, or some uh, JavaScript object, more specifically. So it has a couple properties, Bob, Linda, whatever the case is. And we already know we can log out an object and I can deep dive into the properties. And that is useful and it's cool and I can see things and I'm very happy to have it. But sometimes I want to be able to see that data at a little bit more of a glance. And so there are a few APIs we can use, one of my favorites being console.table. Console.table will allow us to take that same piece and actually convert it to a nice little data table for us so that we can see things in line which is really pretty handy um, as a way to be able to do things. Now that works really well because I had four properties. Um, with a lot more properties, that could get a little cumbersome anyway. But you can specify an inline filter. So all you have to do after the console table is actually provide a list of what you want to be able to see. So name and uh, we'll do age. No way. Way. Um, and we'll just get our, uh, our filter list. Okay. 
So really handy for big objects, really handy when you get big arrays of things that you're trying to deal with that are coming back. Um, very handy. Always still gives you the reference down here, by the way, so you can still, still do other tricks and see it like you would have. And you can also go back and do things like store it as a global variable and things that we talked about. Is that array filtered? That array is not filtered. Okay. okay. Yeah, only the table actually itself is filtered, which is one nice thing, because technically you could filter the object yourself and then send it to the table, but unless you keep a second reference, then you're blah, 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 blah. And this is the idea to make it lightweight. Okay? Table. Uh, now we start getting into a little bit more fun. Um, I, I think it's more fun. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll do time and time end. So as we start going through, the other thing that I see Kyle do all the time is, um, I'm sorry, Kyle. That's okay. It's fine. <laughs> you say that as though you mean it. Um, I do. <laughs> no. All right. So the um, timing, right? I already showed that we could do timestamps, but how many people have written a line of code that says, like, oh, I'm going to, uh, you know, basically record a time and stick it in a variable. And after I record the time and stick it in a variable, then I'll run some code. And then at the end of it, I'll subtract the time I stored from the first time. And then that will give me my, you know, my time. Good job. Um, turns out there's a little bit of an API that can do that for us, right? So we can actually do things in a simple place like console.time. And again, we give it the name of a label. So loops, uh, we'll do loop start. Now, again, we're telling it which counter the counters are being named that we're actually ending. Christian? OK. So loop, loop start took 1.78 milliseconds. Kind of handy, right? Then we can go in and we can actually say, well, we've got these inner things that are going to be called all the time. So we'll call this foo start. Builds up in line, collapsed, and anything else that we want it to be. Kind of cool? So that's a handy one rather than actually going in and, and creating variables and doing things in your code in order to be able to do them. And we'll see how this actually interacts with some timeline stuff in just a bit. Um, but actually, quite, a, quite an interesting way to be able to sort of see um, what's going on. Now, I mentioned timeline stuff because although we're going to jump ahead just a little bit here, all of these. Uh, commands here as well. We'll actually do this for a second. Um, all of these commands here can actually be observed. And we're just going to bounce over there for a moment, and then we'll come back. All of these commands can be uh, observed in the developer tools as well, which we're going to get to a little bit more. But in these performance tools and stuff, and maybe we won't show it now, but we'll talk about it for a moment. In these performance tools where we can actually record a timeline of all the events that happen. So I'll do one. We'll, uh, we'll record a timeline, and we can say, I want to record me hitting do something, and I want to stop recording. Chrome will actually keep a timeline of everything that just happened for us. But the really cool part is that in time, when we actually use things like timestamps and these different pieces, we can make markers effectively in this timeline where we can indicate where something happened that we can search for, and that we can actually go back and forth between um, in order to be able to see things. So there's some pretty cool stuff in terms of what actually happened here um, and what we're able to see. And if we go through here and search for it, we'll actually find that food thing that we actually just uh, put out there. All right, let's back up for a second before I go a whole lot more, because I want to get into the timing profiling uh, pieces. And I think that's actually going to be kind of interesting. So um, we've got a couple of things that. Uh, are important here. And I think these are probably some of the more important things that you can see in the tools. The console API stuff is really cool, but if you're just uh, kind of debugging that way, you're missing an opportunity to do a lot more stuff, OK? So we can do a lot more if we actually understand how the basic debugger works. So just for a few minutes, let's just take a few tours. Most of you probably have some sense of this, but maybe there's a few tricks here that you don't know about. So the debugger itself, um, which can always be viewed under the sources pane, um, is going to allow us to interact with the code anytime we want to. And we can interact with the code in a number of ways. The simplest and most straightforward one that everyone starts with is doing a really basic breakpoint. So we'll go ahead and set a breakpoint here. And when we click the button, we're going to get our breakpoint. 
Now, the cool thing about that at that point is a few things. First of all, we can get a sense of how we got to that breakpoint. In this case, it was because of an event listener. We can look at any variables that are in scope at that moment. And we can watch additional variables if we wanted to that we uh, were curious about what the values were. Okay? So we can interact with those things and we can actually change them. By the way, we can also, which is a really cool trick, we can use the council at this point if we want to to do all sorts of other things because we're, we're live, right? So in this point, if I actually do something like count down here, I will get the value of count and I can interact with it and I can do other terrible things um, like change the value of things and, and, and do others. Okay, so that's cool and that's a basic breakpoint. So a breakpoint is going to stop code execution anytime that it reaches the breakpoint. And the simplest version of those is very useful. But where they get much more useful are things that we can't easily anticipate happening or not a line of code that we want to simply be able to reach. So for example, this breakpoint here, we can go in and say edit. And now we can provide a predicate. What I mean by a predicate is a an expression in this case that is going to be evaluated as true and if it does this breakpoint will be reached. So I can say I only want this breakpoint to occur if count is equal to three. Changes the color to orange, which gives us that sense that it's a conditional breakpoint. And we go on now. And once I click it two more times and our count equals three, we actually break. Okay? So really, really useful stuff when we talk about debugging something more complicated. And you can create really complex breakpoints. As long as it's an expression you can write, it can be evaluated, it can be there. So we can talk about the state of things, we can talk about what got passed in, whatever we want to do to be able to set a breakpoint at that moment. Now that's fun, and that's interesting, and it's extraordinarily helpful. But sometimes, in particular, I find that some of the hardest stuff to hunt down is when something or some sort of DOM changes, and I don't know why. And Chrome also offers an ability to do breakpoints based on DOM changes. So we can actually come over to elements here and we can say, you know what, this button element's really interesting. I would like to create a breakpoint. And the breakpoint can be any time this node is removed or about to be removed, more specifically. We modify any attribute of it or we modify the subtree. So you can set, for instance, on a parent node, and say, if anything in this subtree is modified, I want to break it <coughs> uh, wherever it does it. So in this case, if I say subtree modification, and I go click do something, we get a line of uh, breakpoint there, because that's the line of code that was about to modify that button. Which is insanely helpful as an app gets larger, and as you're trying to understand how and why things interact in the way that they do. Pretty cool. Okay, so subtree modification um, and its ability to, to do things is quite interesting. We can also more generically, if we want to, um, have the idea of being able to, um, go back up here, we can more generically, oh, I should have said this, sorry. We'll see all these things as we're setting them up over here. So if I have a basic breakpoint, I will set it up over here. I can see ones that um, actually, if I have conditionals, if I come over and set a DOM breakpoint again, I see them in the same place, so subtree modification, sorry, break on, subtree mod. I can actually see my DOM breakpoints, um, where I'm breaking in subtree. And I can do a lot of other interesting things too. One of the craziest and only useful, um, in my mind at least, only useful if you combine it with some of the other things we've already talked about, but you can break on sort of event listeners in general types and ways. In other words, you could break when something animates, or when a canvas drawing happens, or a clipboard copy happens, or any of the sorts of things that are under here that are top level objects, you can create a breakpoint that occurs when that happens. So if I were to go through in the generic one that is um, seen a lot, and that's fine, is we'll go to a mouse event, and we'll say that on a mouse up, we actually want to break, okay? And this time we don't have a whole lot of code that's running, but any time that that mouse up occurs, we'll actually reach a breakpoint um, to be able to, to do things. This can be really, really insanely useful when you're debugging animation things or something that's not quite as obvious as to, or having a sense of why something is happening, but to rather get a sense of where it's gonna go. Because this happens just before the invocation of any of the event listeners. So what is about to happen is that every event listener to mouse up in the system 
would now one by one be able to be stepped through from where I'm at in the code for me to be able to check and see what's happening in each one of them. So it can be really insanely useful when you don't know why, but you can tell what's happening, but you have no idea why it's happening. Good? Okay, so those are uh, generically referred to as event listener breakpoints. And you can see there's a whole lot of them um, that you can go back and forth. You can also do them on XHR requests and sorts of other things, which is really useful, because you can basically set up something like, hey, when new data arrives, um, before you call any of the event listeners that are listening to it, do so. Things of that nature, okay? Before, including outbound data, so you can see who's sending something to. Okay, so breakpoints are really cool, and breakpoints get us a lot in terms of debugging, but they still have a concept that's difficult, and that concept is that we have to be stopping the execution of something in order to observe it. Right? And that is useful, but only to an extent, because we may have things that are timing related or others that we want to understand over the long haul. So that's where these two other tabs of both performance and memory come in. Um, network as well. You can actually do a lot of these things in network, but just to limit our scope a little bit for right now. Performance and memory. And to make it slightly more confusing, there's a memory aspect of performance. Okay? But performance and memory allow us to do something that is much more like a snapshot or a time. Uh, timeline in performance basically captures all the events that occur in sequence over the course of time and lets us walk back through any of them as we move through to see what happened. We can see things like render cycles, we can see when data arrived, we can see when script execution was happening, we can see all those things. Memory, conversely, is a snapshot concept. Memory snapshots are take the state of memory right now and let me explore it, let me dive through it. And also, I can take memory snapshot A and memory snapshot B and compare them and see why things are different or what actually has happened between them in time, okay? Which gets really interesting. Now, all of these things, though, end up using concepts, especially the memory side, end up using concepts of roots and garbage collection roots and how all these things work. So now I'm going to go into my little bit of a aside because it's me. And you guys showed up. It's your fault. Um, so, the uh, side that I want to go through is a little bit on what's going on inside of the garbage collection side of things so that we can make some sense of the memory. So if everyone will indulge me for a minute, we'll talk a little bit about what garbage collection is all about and what it's doing inside of the engine, okay? And hopefully this will be, this is my presentation in a presentation that I hope will be useful to you anyway. Alright, so um, I borrowed some of these from a presentation I did this is many moons ago uh, that I really like. That's a math finale that was different. Um, this is a. Uh, this is many moons ago, uh, but it all is relevant, and we'll talk about the changes and differences anyway as we go along. Uh, garbage collection. For those of us who've worked in other languages, um, garbage collection is uh, honestly a somewhat. It's not a new concept. It's, it's quite an old concept, but it's a new concept in terms of uh, certain languages, right? So, in what we have originally, or, or where we would normally work with a. A traditional language, let's say if we were working in C or SM or something of that nature, we would be responsible for allocating and deallocating our own memory. Okay? So we would allocate the memory we want to use, we would use it, we would deallocate it. We are responsible for keeping track of exactly what we used and having a reference to it because if you lose a reference to it, you've got no way to free it up. It's all over, so you don't have a reference to it anymore. Okay? This also means that you have to be very careful and know and have single areas inside of an application which can either you keep things globally or you have an area inside the application that somehow knows what memory you've allocated so that you can get back to that point in order to deallocate it. It tends to have to make applications very linear or loop-like in the sense that they have to go through the same area of code from either a beginning or end period of time in order to be able to do things. <coughs> Garbage collection, conversely, is the idea that perhaps we shouldn't be focused on that aspect, that we should <coughs> allow an automated subsystem to handle it. Now, the good part about garbage collection is that it frees up developers from having to pay attention to a lot of these particular details and on the whole actually tends to produce more reliable applications. We don't have the whole class of issues where we forget to allocate something or we deallocate something in the wrong order or we deallocate the wrong thing or, 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 or all of which happen. The disadvantage is, is that it's another process that's running so it's slow comparatively. It's slow to be able to, to deallocate memory because there's an automated process that has to figure out when things can be deallocated. And the, con the other possibility we have is that if we screw it up, we get to the point where something doesn't go away. 
We can't manually force something to disappear from memory. We instead have to be responsible for not using it, which is what lets the garbage collector know that we're all done. So in this case, we're going to oversimplify this a lot. Um, but what we're going to talk about is that our program code effectively proxies okay, the use of garbage collection. So what we're doing about this, or what we're trying to do, is that we are, instead of directly hitting with memory, we're going through something as a proxy. We're always taking a step back. We talk to somebody who's going to handle memory for us, who's going to return the memory we want, and is going to take care of getting, the mem getting rid of the memory. Now, the easy part is getting the memory. The really hard part is giving it back. So things that go wrong when we uh, manually memory memory, if we allocate something of a size and we go and play with it and then we free it up, well, we're kind of in trouble if we ever actually try to access something after we freed it. right? So we have an order dependency. We have something that is now really, really important that if we have a complicated application with lots of branching or, or it's big in any way, we have to make sure that we know that we're never going to actually deallocate something before we uh, are done with it. And while this is fine, it also means that we have to be very cognizant of what's going on at the lower level. And we have to architect our application, and often architect our application, because this is a pain, not to allocate and deallocate a lot of memory, but to probably use chunks of application memory that we go back to over and over again. Um, that's not necessarily a best practice from design, nor security, nor any of the other things that happen. Because if we take a whole bunch of memory and we reuse it in this really cool global space that everyone knows about and is in exactly one space, and we store all of the things that would ever be relevant to our application in this one place in memory, that's also a great way to write an application that's incredibly insecure. Because somebody can go look at that area of application and get all the things they ever needed. OK. so. Um, we can also doubly free our memory, so trying to free the same memory twice is kind of problematic. Uh, we don't want to do that. And we can actually leak it, because what, this is what's called a real leak. There's a, there's a difference, we're, we're going to use the term leak, but a real leak, the real actual original version of it is that we lose reference to the thing that we need to allocate. So in other words, P1 we allocate some memory, P2 we, go to, we allocate some more memory, we no longer have a reference at all once we do this um, to the original P1. There is literally no way we can get back to it, find the memory to dereference it. It's gone, it's there until the program terminates, it is no longer ours. And the only reason it works after the program terminates, by the way, is probably because there was a garbage collector in the operating system that took care of it for us. If not, there's literally nothing until you turn off the machine and turn it back on. Okay, so GC instead is gonna take care of these situations by determining when a chunk of memory is no longer accessible and freeing it. So GC's job is Instead of being explicit, it's being implicit. Okay? So in the normal malloc version of things, we explicitly say, I want this chunk of memory, and then we explicitly say, I'm done with this chunk of memory. In a GC world, we say we want something by creating an object or consuming memory, and when we're done with it, well, it's kind of like the reason they call it a garbage collector is we sort of leave it on the floor. And <laughs> if it's on the floor, and nobody's using it anymore, and nobody seems to pay attention to it anymore, and the garbage collector comes and picks it up, dumps it in the trash can, and gets rid of it. Okay? But the trick is knowing when we're not using it anymore. Okay? So GC can't understand your program logic, not completely yet. It can't understand exactly what you intended to do or not. So it tries to keep track of what you are still using. And it does that mostly by what you could still be using. Okay? So if you have the ability to do it. So this is the easy part. The, the harder part is figuring out how. So um, it's when and where we free memory. Now, this is the single biggest problem, especially in modern JavaScript applications, because a lot of the folks that came to modern JavaScript applications didn't come from a background where they ever had to manage memory. And it's not something that they think about. It's not something that they consider in terms of what happens. But especially as we now have either traditional web apps or progressive web apps, we have things that are running for a very long time in the browser. And if you're screwing up memory, and if you continue to consume it, and let's say you're writing an enterprise application that somebody is going to be using for seven or eight hours a day, you can have quite a big problem if you don't understand how to manage memory. Okay? And managing memory in here is playing nicely with the garbage collector. So um, let's go on on decisions. So two types of memory. and. It's just timing. We're going to oversimplify some things, OK? Just kind of just a couple terms, close, good enough. But two types of memory we're going to work with in general here, we're going to call heap and stack, OK? 
he holds most of the large object storage, the, the sort of objects that we want to do. Stack is a more transient memory, although conversely, stack is the type of memory you can actually figure out at compile time if you have a compiled language, whereas heap's not, uh, because stack will always be more local variables. So stack variables are things like this. When uh, we have stack as a data structure only, it means that we have a first and last out scenario. We put books on our desk, item one goes in, item two goes in, item three goes on top of it. We theoretically can't get down to item one unless we remove item two, three and then item two. Okay, so our stack builds and removes. Now, altering that stack to get on item four means that we have to get rid of item three. We get down to two pieces, we put on item four. This is what's happening constantly in the background of the, the VM as it's running over and over again. In fact, when we do a local variable declaration, it looks something like this. Something like this. When we declare three variables, um, we would get something in a stack that would look kind of like that. Okay? We stack them up in memory. And we throw them, and those are our local variables. So our function do thing executes, we get three variables that are on the stack, three places that we can actually hold on to things. If we have a function call, the function call tends to actually use the stack as well. Okay? Each of these things actually pushes their local variables on. So ignoring the sum method or some function or whatever I called it at this moment, uh, we have a, b, and c. If we call a function, eventually this function is going to push its new variable right on top of the stack. Okay, So we're going to keep building up in terms of our function call. This, by the way, is what allows recursion to happen because of the fact that we can re-enter the same code and it just keeps throwing things on top of the stack over and over again. And it doesn't care where they were. It just cares about their position on the stack. Now, realistically, actually what happens when we do function calls, which is kind of cool, is the reason function calls actually work is that we, we actually, when we, we push our variables onto the stack and then we call a function, we actually push kind of a version of ourselves. It's actually technically like a program counter idea. But we push a version of ourselves onto the stack and then the next variable. And this means that we have a way to figure out where we came from. That's how we get back to things. So in this code here, um, when we're looking at it, we have something like ABC gets called. Then we would have pushed some method one on and then X. And then when some method one was done and came to the next line of code, those two things would have got popped off. And then we call this one. So we push this back on. And then we push on sorry, Y here. So our stack is constantly doing this in memory. Okay? Every function call, every bit of thing we're doing, our stack is oscillating back and forth. Ideally, unless you're an infinite recursion, then it just goes one way. Okay, so our stack, is, our stack is oscillating up and down as we're keeping track of things. But this isn't where we store any type of object or any variable. Okay? This is where we store references. This is where we store some types of primitives, things like that. But that's what's actually stored on the stack. What actually, for the memory that most people think of is kind of the larger memory, like let's say we declare an object, we actually have heap memory for these things. So in this case, in our stack, we have that variable O, and it contains a reference to object A, which is created out here in heap memory. Okay? So our objects out, the big objects out here in heap memory, our stack keeps a reference to that object. Make sense? Okay. So we've got a reference to that object, and as we're going along here calling things, we're keeping these references. So in this case, we called something, we had object 1, and it had a reference to object A, and then we called a function called do it, and we passed, object, or then passed this object through, and so we have an O2 on memory, which actually happens to be the same reference as O1, so they're pointing to the same thing in memory, yada, yada, yada. Okay? So as we're going along, we're constantly keeping references between the stack and the heap, in, uh, from the stack to the heap uh, as we move things along. The heap, which isn't really actually a single thing, but the heap is where all of our memory is, is basically stored that tends to have any real significant and long-term value to what's going on. See, in, in most uh, traditional languages, you couldn't create something complicated in a function and return it, okay? Because if you created a complicated object in a function, when you returned it, it there was no way to return it on the stack. Okay, there was no way to put it in that slot. So heap memory is the key that we could create an object or a big one out in some other function and when we return, we can get a reference to it because it's just out here in the heap. Okay, it allows us to move things around as, as we feel like it. Okay, so um, when we actually return from calling a function, the stack is always unwound. And what that means is that you'll see, as I talked about, our stack oscillates. It goes up, 
comes down, goes up, comes down. So in this case, after we've returned from calling do it, and this is just indicating where our, our program is currently at, we're back here, we still have an object out there, and we now only have our variable A on the stack and our reference to object one. That's how we're basically throwing things on the stack. That's the easy part. Now how do we free them? How do we get rid of them? And freeing them is basically an idea of deallocating or freeing. It's the idea that if we aren't using it, or if it's no longer needed, it can go away. The trick is figuring out how it's no longer needed, or if it's no longer needed. And this is the first time where we get into something that is really important called a root. All right, so in unmanaged memory, so in traditional systems where you're mallocing and you're freeing memory, you're managing these things for yourself. But in a managed memory model, what we need to do is we're asking something else to manage the entire lifetime of what we build. So when we ask for a chunk of memory right from the beginning or from the beginning of the program, we get something that's kind of basically approximate to a root. So it's at the first chunk of memory off of the, the garbage collector or the garbage collector's page of memory. It's very possible that we have something that assigns another chunk of memory to that memory, right? We can have an object that has complex objects that has complex objects that has complex objects all the way down. And as we're doing so, each one of those still has to exist but they aren't roots in themselves. Meaning that if you have an object, and so you have, you're an object for me, you're gonna be my model. You have an object, okay? You now have a pointer behind you to the next object. You're my root, okay? I talk to you, you talk to the next person, so you can think of it as something tree-like, okay? The root is the, the root of that tree, or the top, the, the, the trunk of the tree, and that's what we're talking about in terms of roots as we go down. We have many, many, many things that go down in different directions over and over and over again, and these are these roots, okay? Make sense? So what's very important is that it's really hard to understand in a system like JavaScript or any modern system why <coughs> something is stuck in memory. Because the garbage collector is trying to figure out, do you need it? And the simplest way that it can prove that you don't need it is if there's no way you can ever get it again. If you're my root and you point on to every other piece of memory in the system, and I lose track of you, well then not only can you be collected, but everything else you were referencing can if I don't have any way of referencing it, okay? So the moment I can't get back to that memory, the moment I am totally ignorant of it anymore, it can go away. And that's the premise of the garbage collector. It disappears when I'm done with it. To figure that out though, it has to figure out Am I done with it, right? It has to, it has to understand how I, I go through it. And so one of the ways that we do this is the garbage collector is aware of all our roots, and it's a starting point for a lot of the things we need to do. Now, some of this is, and this is where it gets tricky, because different browsers actually implement this slightly differently. So we'll just talk about a couple concepts right now, conceptually, and I'll give you some hints on exactly what V8 does as well. So the traditional form of, of managing this was called reference counting, okay? And reference counting was, this will be very, very simple. I will keep track of the fact that I have one reference to you. And if I, in some way, have another variable that has a reference to you, now I've got two, okay? If I get rid of one, I'm back down to one. We'll just keep count of what goes on. So reference counting is a dead simple way to imagine each object and figure out if I actually need it anymore. If it's got a count, I need it. If it doesn't have a count, I don't anymore. Now, so it keeps track of the number of reference counts, and it looks something like this, right? So A, there's a reference to A. B has a reference to B, which means that object A has two references to it, whereas object B only has one, OK? So even if I get rid of A, right, like if I lose the pointer to A there, the reference to A, object A still stays in memory because it still has at least one reference count. B is holding on to, to object B. An object B is talking to object A, therefore I'm not allowed to get rid of them. It has to stay in memory. This is how most, and this is, I, this is important, really, really important, but this is also how most memory leaks happen, right? Is that I don't realize I have this, and through some big, long, transient chain, there's 23,000 other things that are actually being held in memory, and that's what's stopping something from being collected or going away. Like a console log that has a reference. Like a console log that has a reference to something. In our case, if we, for instance, console log B, uh, B nor A could ever go away, okay? All right, so reference counting is dead simple, and it means that if instead 
I, uh, in my little code here, if I uh, set B to null, well, since B can go away, B will get collected, I would still hold on to A. Okay? So A would stay. So we only count about destinations, right? So it doesn't matter that B was holding on to A before, because if A didn't have any way to get back to B, then it doesn't matter if B exists. I had no way to get to it. It's gone. For my purposes, uh, it's completely indeterminate. It's very Schrodinger's cat of, uh, of collections. All right. So um, if I get rid of my reference to A, now everything can disappear, right? The moment I have no references to everything, uh, everything can go away. And that is the essence of what we want to accomplish in garbage collection. I'm going to get rid of the things that we don't need. Once we have things that we don't need anymore, they're pulled. They're gone. The problem with something like reference counting is this. What if A is set to B and B is set to A? Um, now they both have one reference, and I can't reach either one of them. And in a reference counting scenario, they will happily stay married forever until I turn off the machine. Um, they are there, and they are permanent. So reference counting issues uh, are vast, and it's the reason that old, not most virtual machines use this anymore. Also, it takes a little bit of memory to keep the reference count, and it takes time to update reference counts when references change and things like that. So the way that most people deal with reference counting or reference counting issues is called mark and sweep. Okay? Mark and sweep is a slightly more advanced version on our pathway towards modern browsers, or where modern browsers currently are. So mark and sweep collection involves the idea that we will have an extra bit, just one that we'll store on every object. And it's called a mark bit. And what we do when we see a tree of objects like this is that we have our two objects down here that are referencing each other. We have all of these objects in the system. And it's time for us to figure out what memory we can clean up. So what we do is we start at those all important GC roots the parts where we first allocated memory and kind of held on to things. And we walk the tree of every single object, and we mark it. And every object that, once we're done, if we start at the root and we walk through every object, then everything that didn't get marked was unreachable. There was simply no way it could ever be reached again. The program can't possibly get to it. It can be freed. It can go away. So mark and sweep is extremely effective at getting rid of even these scenarios where we have circular references. Problem is, work and sweep can be a bit slow. Um, so we'll talk about where that goes next. But it's really, really effective. Uh, who knows about weak map in ES6? OK. A weak map is a special concept that works with garbage collection. Weak, a weak map is something that allows you to store. All right, let me go take a step back. In a traditional object, all the keys, so anything that's a property of the object has to be a string. Okay? If you give it something that's not a string, it converts it to a string. Which means that if I take three objects and I try to give it to an object as keys and their two string method all returns object, object, I end up with one property and that's it. So everything has to be a key in a traditional object. Okay? A weak map is a special type of object that allows you to use other objects as keys. Which means you're really using references as keys. Can be really handy for a number of reasons. Let's say I have a bunch of DOM nodes. Okay? And I want to keep track of some data associated with all the DOM nodes in this list. Great. I can throw them in a weak map, and I can literally use each one of those DOM nodes as a reference to go look up some value that goes along with it. It can be really fast, really, really effective, and a really good way to go. But from what we were talking about before, if we stick all these objects inside of another object, suddenly they have a reference again, and we can't garbage collect them. <clears throat> So a weak map is a special type of thing that allows you to use objects as keys, but they don't count in this mark and sweep cycle. Okay? So what that really means is that if we look at something like this, um, when we create a, a weak map, we say our D is some new weak map, and then D of some object equals 5. Okay? By the way, all of the keys have to be object-like. They can't be strings at all in a weak map. So, um, and only the keys can be weak. So what actually happens in this case is that you can think of it as a dotted line. Instead of it being a solid line between this object and here, it's a dotted one. So it's held on, and we keep track of it, and it's there. But if it turns out that no one else in the system except for us is holding on to this thing anymore, then it can go away, because you can't reach it from us. This is a dotted line that the garbage collector can't traverse. 
So effectively, what this a weak map allows you to do is a leak, weak map allows you to store a bunch of things and say, I want to hold on to these so long as somebody else cares. But if nobody else cares, don't make me the reason that you keep this thing in memory forever. I am good with it going away if I am the last person. But up until the point where I'm the last person, it's really important I keep it. And this is really, really important for things like caching and really, really important for things like working with DOM nodes and other things where you don't know or you don't want to screw up the case that somebody else might modify it and you, you kind of need to write code that's independent of it. Okay, anyway, as long as we were here, I just wanted to talk about what a weak reference was. Um, so, uh, but a side note, um, as soon as we get weak references in languages, people that don't understand them immediately advocate for things. So you can go online and go to Stack Overflow and you can find like 300 posts that are totally advocating for using weak maps by 323 people who have no, I know it's like 100 people over and over again, that are totally advocating for it and have no idea what it does. Um, so you shouldn't always use weak maps because let's say that you said, hey, this is my new weak map and this brand new object. So I say my weak map of new object equals seven. But pretty much the moment that line of code runs, it's gone. Because there was no one else holding on to that object. So it went into a weak map. The weak map says, well, if I'm the only one holding on to it and there's no one else that needs it, I don't need it anymore. It's gone out of the weak map on the next line of code when you try to get rid of it. Um, so people cause themselves a lot of problems by using, again, a really powerful tool. Back to Peter Parker, great power, great responsibility. We're good. OK, so back on track for a moment. Um, people don't like large pauses uh, in their application. Uh, when these things happen. And we know that garbage collection takes time. So there is a basically a non-stop desire to try to make garbage collection go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And that's good. Um, so how do you do it? Well, first of all, you don't do it all at once. That's one of the simplest ways is people find ways to do a little bit at a time. But then there's also really optimized ways that we can do things. And one of the ones that is favored by V8 and by many others right now is something called generational. Um, or ephemeral, if you'd like. Uh, garbage collection. Ephemeral garbage collection um, is based on a really simple concept. It is much, much, much more likely if you create an object right now that it's going to probably be short-lived, like you might be in a loop, you might be something else, much more likely that the object you just created is going to be short-lived than an object that's been around a while. So if instead of treating everything as a big flat space, all the memory out there, we can start treating it something like this, which is that we have age, right? So new objects are kept in this short-term space here, also called the young space, okay? Where when we throw objects in there, we check on those objects a lot more frequently to see if they can go, okay? It takes less time, there's less of them, we check it very frequently to see if we can. If we have gone through this a couple of times and that thing has stayed around, then we kind of assume maybe the user wants to keep it around. And so different implementations handle this differently, but we slowly move it off into some older space that gets checked still, but checked a lot less frequently, just on the fact that the heuristics suggest that it's going to actually probably stay around longer. Now Chrome, when they do this actually, uh, V8 actually implements, I should say V8, not Chrome, because this applies to Node as well implements this with um, a couple of areas. Not only does it have this young and this older area, it also totally takes really large objects and keeps them in a completely separate area by themselves as well. Uh, that way it doesn't have to follow them down under the premise again that these big large objects, if you really stored them and kept them for more than a GC cycle or so, they're probably something relatively constant in the application that's going to stick around a while. So they get carried in a whole another page by themselves that's not separate from everything else. Okay, So we kind of keep things around and we move things. We move them over the course of time, and different implementations of ephemeral uh, garbage collection use different tiers. Okay, uh, This is a pretty common one, that you have something that's short term, something that's kind of medium term, something that's much more old. And as you do that, you also are continually checking this region less frequently, less frequently. All right. So the heuristics of this suggest that you can be much faster as you're doing things. And this is what's happening inside a modern like a V8 and, and garbage collection engine. Okay, We're doing things like that. But the key and the takeaway from all of those things so far that I've been battling about is that we actually need to understand that we have roots. We have these garbage collection roots that which, to which everything is somehow going to be tied to. And if we want to figure out why something is staying in memory, we have to get back to being able to understand how those, those roots apply to things. Does this all make sense, or at least most of it? Okay, so back to some code. Uh, that was my tangent. 
Um, it was a long tangent. All right, so we're going to go on to a little example here that we'll play with for a while. And let me get rid of this performance one and up this a little bit. OK, so in our scenario here, in my little, uh, let's see, yeah, we'll use this one, index 5, index 5. All right, we're just going to, for fun, I lied, it was index 6. I'm sorry. All right, index 6. We're going to do something kind of fun, um, which is we're going to go off and, for fun, we're going to create, uh, when the button is clicked, we're going to create an, uh, a list, okay? And then we'll just loop through and we'll append a whole, uh, in this case, 10 list, in, uh, list indicators or list elements to it. And then when we're done, uh, we're going to do nothing. Nothing at all. But can they go away? What happens to them? Yeah. So this one, waste, exists out here, right? So as long as this script tag is in scope, which is kind of forever because it's on the HTML page, it's going to have a reference to that. And so what will happen to the inner nodes? The LIs I create. Any ideas? They're going to stick around. We're all linked together. They're going to stick around, right? Because this thing was created, and Waste owns that thing. And these were all added to Waste. So that transient idea applies that since I'm holding on to waste and waste is holding on to these things, it'll be there forever and ever and ever and ever because I can't clear it. Okay, there's nothing I can do to make it go away. So we can see this in action pretty quickly. And to do that, we're going to get over to our. Um, <laughs> the, uh, sorry. Um, so to do so, we're going to get over to our uh, memory tools. Our memory tools allow us to do a bunch of different things and some sampling and stuff. We're probably just going to get through some heap snapshot stuff tonight, okay? Um, but our heap snapshot allows us to take a snapshot of what's going on in memory. Also, there's a couple other cool tools on this page. That little garbage can right there actually allows us to collect garbage. It allows us to say, right now, now remember, V8 Chrome, these, these engines, and uh, V8 engine instead of Chrome is continually trying to collect garbage, but it does it at its schedule. In fact, it actually does it based on allocations. But the point is, it does it on its schedule. That little button there says, right now, though, I want to inspect memory. So I'd like you to do it right now before I inspect memory so that I know everything that could go away is gone. OK? So if I do that, and I then say I would like to take a heap snapshot, it'll take a moment to pull it together. And this will show me everything that is actually in memory right now um, inside of, of this browser window. And there's actually surprisingly a lot. If you're really bored, you can poke around in here sometime. Um, but we can see what types of objects exist, what types of things they are. A lot of it's going to be compiled code, um, things like that that we see. But we can take any one of these objects, and we can dive into it. And what we're doing now when we do so is we're following, um, we are following the pathway of those roots and those extensions like I was showing you. So if we take an object and we open it up, we can see any properties that that object had. And then as we continue to dive down, we can actually figure out where and why it's being held in a memory. So this one happened to be some image data. As you can see, there's some PNGs and some things that are actually stuck in it that are being held in there. By the way, uh, one of the most interesting things that you find out very quickly when you start profiling memory is that all those cool little Chrome extensions you can under that you can add into your browser, all of them take memory and are in your Chrome instance. And when you go to start debugging, all of them are doing things and allocating stuff and moving things around. So one of the best things you can do for yourself if you're actually you know, mildly interested in staying sane is to <laughs> disable all of those things before you actually start bugging it. Because otherwise, you just find out, like, why did 300 new arrays get allocated? And it's like, oh, because Google Voice got a message in the background and I didn't know it. Um, very, very disconcerting. OK. So we can see, um, we can dive through everything from window all the way down. And some of these you can see Chrome extension pieces on here. These are actually what is taking memory right now. Um, but all of these things can actually be uh, looked at, including the actual HTML elements on the page and which each of those elements are, where it's at. We can see its properties. We can see everything that's going on and what elements hold on to which ones. Now, this little bit of code here that I showed you is going to create a, a UL, and then it's going to populate with 10 uh, LIs, all right? 
So what we're going to do is we will get rid of this snapshot for right now and we'll click do something and we'll come over here and we'll take heap snapshot. And we can actually find those things in here, any of the um, elements that we've actually created, our button, etc. But we also have filtering just like we had with the console and it's really, 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 really handy. Uh, because we can take a look at things that are actually happening here um, in terms of, of whether we want to see things as a summary, how what things are contained, statistics, etc. And in this case, we can actually see here's our detached elements. So it's going to tell us, hey, there happens to be one of these that is currently in memory that's not on the DOM, and there's ten of these that are currently in memory and not on the DOM somewhere, and a host of other stuff. Okay. And so we can actually you know, browse our way into this. And as you start looking, we can say, wow, that was a detached element. And if you look down here, it's going to tell me that it's because it was stuck in a variable called waste. OK? So it's really, really powerful because you can start tracing through what's actually connected to what and how it's coming through and why something is stuck in the system. OK? A couple of terms for you really quickly. Distance is, when we were talking a little bit earlier about that garbage collection route stuff, distance is, you can think of it roughly as the number of hops from a garbage collection route to where you find this, okay, the distance from a route. The shallow size and retain size are two really interesting things that are sometimes a little confusing. The only things that really have big shallow sizes can be arrays and or strings. Um, shallow size is the amount of memory that an object in itself consumes, okay? And the retained size is the amount that that object is keeping in memory altogether. So since objects can have pointers to other objects and they can spread things out, we can see that our retained size, our shallow size, with the exception of a very minor number of cases, will always be small. And our retained size will be the larger number because one is how much memory we have and one is the amount of memory that we are forcing to stick around because of our existence. Okay? The number of things that are going down. Which who you, means, who you link to. what was that? Who you link to. Who you link to or, yes, and that's the children. easiest way, right? Like and their children. And their children and their children and, you know, however else you're, you're keeping things around. Okay, so um, we can dip through here and it's going to actually give us quite a bit of information. Waste happens to be in the native context, which is in the window. We can kind of dig through and through and through and through and see where we're actually going to be at. Let's do something else, though, really quickly, which I think is kind of interesting. We'll go back here and we'll refresh this. And we'll take a snapshot right now. And then we'll hit do something and we'll take another snapshot. Okay, so for any of these snapshots, we can say we want to see all objects, or we can actually say, I'd like to see objects that were allocated before snapshot one or between snapshot one and snapshot two. Okay, so by doing this, I can see anything that happened between those two snapshots, right? Which is fantastic when you're talking about um, memory and what's actually being kept around and what we're doing um, in between things. So we can actually, and it literally, by the way, one of the interesting tricks is since Chrome's developer tools run in the browser that you're in, you're almost always going to get mouse events because I moved the mouse to do that. Um, so that's just one of those things that you get used to seeing a little bit. Okay, so now I can take a look at what objects were here and what the total retained size of any objects that were kept around. For the most part, they're not necessarily going to be mined, and this is something that takes a moment to get used to. <coughs> Chrome is a really advanced machine that sometimes uh, actually goes off and jits code, right? It makes new code. And it makes the new code when you actually run the function, which means that until I ran that function and clicked that button, Chrome didn't bother to actually compile that JavaScript code that I was about to run. So the difference between those two, some of what it did was create compiled code for that function that I was about to run. Okay, So one has to understand as well what impact and differences they're having on the system that may not be obvious when you're trying to keep that in mind. Fortunately, we can filter those sorts of things out. But when we see all these sorts of things that change between them, we somehow have to understand that a little bit of, of the virtual machine is playing into action too, um, and that things are actually changing between them. Now, the um, when we actually get into uh, all of these sorts of elements and, and pieces that change, 
Um, the diffs between these are obviously extraordinarily helpful. And being able to see them in different orders, as I mentioned this before, but we can actually see um, sort of comparison. In other words, this is our size delta. How much was freed and how much did we actually gain in the course of that delta and by what? So system-wise, we actually freed that much, but we allocated this much in the course of it. So if we have an object or we have something that's out there, we can actually take a look at how much was freed and how much gained. And in our case, if we go down and take a look at those detached elements that we intentionally created, there's those 10, right? Detached elements that we created. Well, yeah, they're, they're only allocated right now because we created them. There's nothing freed by this process. There was more of them that we just created and they're hanging around in memory and there's nowhere for them to go right now. Does, did it tell you where in the code base the waste reference was? Yes, so we can go back and uh, all you have to do to, to be able to get to that is that as soon as we actually start looking at these um, objects, we'll actually start getting the tree. But is there a line number? Or any no, we're not going to get a line number okay. um, in terms of it. We can go back a little bit and we can reveal things in summary views, um, but it's tricky to sometimes get line numbers at that point. But if you were to do hop over to the console and uh, on, uh, set that to null and then take another snapshot, you would be able to kill clear it up. You would be able to say, OK, that was the one. Yep, okay. for sure. Cool. Going to do things like that. We'll probably play with some of that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so you, that's the cool thing about all the interactions and things that you can actually so you do. You know, that's the thing that's actually that is the, the thing that did it. Other. And there are ways to hone in on this a little bit more that we'll get to. But the problem is, it becomes a little bit more um, it becomes a little more magic as you go along, and it becomes also hard to understand. See, original memory profilers like this didn't do very much work for you. They just showed you here's memory, and you were responsible for figuring everything out. And that was terribly difficult, but it was complete. Modern profilers, especially like this, are doing a lot of work for you, which is really helpful because they're helping narrow down trees and saying, you know what, actually I looked through and although there are 37 references of you, 36 of them are because it's a doubly linked list and it all comes back to you and there's only one that actually happens to be from the outside world. And let me tell you, that's incredibly helpful. But it also means you lose a little bit of information, a little bit of specificity in that reduction, and sometimes it makes some of the things a little bit harder as well. OK, so memory snapshots are basically going to give us a realistic look at what's in memory right now, OK? And what is changing as we go along. Um, for anything that we do, and we should be able to see this if we go back here, and we'll do, um, we'll, we'll make this really cheesy because I, I want to. Um, if waste, waste equals undefined. Ah, typing's hard. They should fix that. All right. Otherwise, we'll create it, okay? So this is basically giving us a little flip-flop back and forth so that um, if we want to continue to mess with this, we can. So if it exists, we kill it. If it doesn't exist, then we create it. All right? Over and over and over again. So let's go back here. And this is just clearing our existing snapshots. Oh, by the way, all of these snapshots you can save and load. So you can save a snapshot to disk, and then you can load it back up in a later comparison. So that means that you could save it off. You can go change some code that you think is going to, to uh, do differently or make it work differently. You can reprofile it. You can load up the old one, and then you can do a comparison between the two. Can you do that post filter? Yes. All right, so um, we'll come in here, we'll clear out existing snapshots, and we'll start with taking a heap snapshot right now. We'll do something. We'll take another heap snapshot. We'll do something again, and we'll take a final one. OK, so now between all of these, we'll actually see that we can, as this number of snapshots go up, we can compare all of these different pieces in between uh, different levels, right? So we can see the objects, compare where we are to the objects created between one and two, and we'll be able to see it, or we can go on to the objects created between two and three, okay? Which will be an increasingly small number as we go on and we do things, and in this case, obviously, we've eliminated things. We will no longer see in terms of these snapshots at all, um, and let's actually just go back to all objects, 
We have some detached anchor elements and div elements, but those aren't us. Those are other things. You'll notice that if we look here, versus back in snapshot two, where we have our detached li and, and uh, ul, uh, we've effectively gotten rid of those because of the fact that we cleared out that reference. So that reference went away when we set waste equal to undefined, and all the nodes were then cleaned up and went away. Okay. So we can take a, a note of the difference between these things. We can dive in and we can understand the differences between them. And then if, as I'm kind of pointing out, but you can see down here, this view is called retainers. Okay. By the way, the reason I have to click on this first is these are groups. Right now it's summarizing things in grouping and then showing me the actual thing underneath it. So you can see there was three objects. This one being 21 away from the group, this one being six, this one being six. Okay. So I can click that. And then I can actually see, oh yeah, that's because of some uh, window that's using jQuery, uh, which is kind of interesting to note that my, one of my Chrome extensions is using jQuery. Um, but it is. I don't know why, but it is. All right. So the uh, being able to see these roots and being able to see the distance between them is the understanding. In general, if you're trying to debug something, not always, but in general, you're always looking or you're usually looking for the things with the lower number of roots because the or the number of distance from the GC root, because those are likely the ones that are more global or staying around, right? Because you don't really want to have to go find why that one down there is hanging out. Ideally, you kind of want to see what was up here that's keeping it around. Uh, anybody know the number one thing, if you had to guess one concept, that causes memory leaks inside of systems? Does not, not behind the keyboard. keyboard. What was it? Not disconnecting from subscribers, not unsubscribing. Yeah, it's, a, it's event listening, any sort of messaging or event listening. Okay? Kyle. Uh, this one he actually did. What? So. Wait. Oh, dang. <laughs> so I want a concrete example of this. Uh, yeah, remember that analytics thing you were working on? I'll have to recall that from my memory. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was like a week ago? I'll have to recall. Just so you know, a week ago. So polite reminded, yep. knowing that you could talk until 10 o'clock. Much later. You have about 25 minutes. No worries. We'll, we'll, we'll bring it down in about 10, and then we'll leave it for questions. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say challenge accepted, but I'm probably going to fail. So let's just work with what we've got, and we'll okay. go from there. OK. All right, we can come back and do a deeper dive on some of these. All right, so event listeners, subscribers, any sort of environment where you do that sort of action is the number one cause of objects that stay in memory. And it is because of the fact that it is unintuitive to many people on how that subscription mechanism works. I would like to we'll act it out. Hey, Kyle, you want to help? Sure. All right, cool. <laughs> uh, well, I've made fun of you a lot, so it seems like fair. All right, so if I'm a function, or if I'm a chunk of code in, uh, over here, and I add an event listener to Kyle, OK, Kyle's an event dispatcher. So I say, Kyle, about add event listener, Mike. That doesn't actually mean I have a reference to Kyle. What I've actually done is I've said, Kyle, I want you to notify me when something happens, <coughs> which means Kyle has a reference to me, not the other way around. Okay, So that actually means that if I add an event listener to Kyle, if Kyle's in memory, I'm in memory, because he has a reference to me. It is forever there. Okay, And so when we add event listeners, especially when we add big global event listeners to things, mouse events and click events and things like that, that do not ever go away in the course of it, if we are not careful to remove those correlated listeners, we are stuck in memory forever and everything that we have in memory. So as an example, let's write this little bit of code. Oh wait, we did. We're adding an event listener for a click handler. We are in memory. Even if I take this waste thing and I kept it in here, right? I didn't have to make it any more global than this. What was it? Because the moment I am in memory here with this uh, piece, <coughs> could not see it. I, as an event listener, I have added an event listener for this function that's right here, All right? Which means that so long as the document button is in memory, that function can't leave memory. And here I've created a UL and I've added 10 
to it, I'm not going away. What are you thinking, Christian? From just uh, just based on stack memory. Yeah, memory we'll we'll talk about this in a moment. Um, the particular place that things are particularly insidious are when we have closure scopey things, right? Because anywhere, and in fact, this is the real thing as we were seeing. It may not have been obvious at first, but the reason that the initial example was here, or was, was problematic, it's actually the better point, um, is that when uh, how a closure scope works is that when this function was created, everything that was in scope was retained, right? So waste, even though it wasn't used anywhere else, once it was assigned to something in here, we add an event listener, we add this function. So the real reason that we end up keeping everything around and nothing could be garbage collected is the fact that that button has a reference to this function. This function was created and kept waste in scope during the creation. Nobody else is using anything here, right? There's no one else that even has access to waste or anything else, but there's nothing that could be done if I have something that's in scope. So that's a bit of a, a, a little bit of a stretch, but the point is, without getting into too much code, is that when we create closure scopes, we retain, we close around variables. So when we take something that's in closure scope and we add it to Kyle, um, and we ask him, or we add an event listener to him, not only am I in scope now and, and not going to garbage collect, but everything that was in scope when the function that I subscribed to Kyle with is also not going to garbage collect so long as Kyle exists, okay? And this is how we continue to build things up in, in memory. And why it can be actually a little tricky to figure things out is anything that I could had in reference or was in scope could potentially be something that I need access to. So it can't go away. I can't go away because Kyle needs to notify me when something happens. And if Kyle's a global thing that doesn't go away, then none of that goes away, all right? So that's why um, even when you don't think you're going to use them, things like add event listener and always balancing the number of times you add an event listener and remove them are particularly important because that's our way of making sure that we don't end up with a bunch of stuff that's retained and can't go away. That just can't be plucked out of memory, okay? Uh, let's spend just a minute, we won't go very far uh, with this, but let's go ahead and spend a minute just so you can see a little bit of the things uh, in the performance profiler. Because um, I think it's interesting, even if we don't have a chance to do a lot with it right now, it's still uh, it's still quite cool. We'll just create 10,000 or so elements. Um, that ought to make a mark in the profiler somewhere. Um, and here we'll do some other things too. Um, let uh, array and uh, hey Christian, if I screw this up, uh, fix it for me. Uh, waste equals. Let's call it maniac, so we have <sighs> And now I'm not interested in Kristen's opinion anymore. Um, all right, so we'll make an array uh, from that, and then we will append whatever was previously in waste. There we go. Uh, you want to spread that? Yep, I do. Yeah. All right, that should make a nice big array. Um, <laughs> Uh, of elements. We should be able to see that um, in terms of things that we do. So this uh, the reason I asked Christian to um, watch this, by the way, is this is a really convenient syntax for making an array of an arbitrary length with just empty elements, OK? So you can say array from, and you're just specifying that you want this length, and you got that array. Almost invariably, I screw up the syntax uh, and say new array, and then it doesn't work out. Uh, so I was hoping at this time either I was going to get it right or maybe the additional pressure would help me. It did. Concat would have worked. Concat also would have worked in that case. All right. So we'll go over to here performance for a moment. And there's two really interesting, cool checkboxes, one of which will be useless in our, our current application. But maybe, maybe in a moment we'll, we'll show you where it would be, which is screenshots. And the other one is memory, deciding if we want to keep track of memory. So let's go ahead and start recording a snapshot. And we will say, do something. And then we will finish recording our snapshot. <laughs> OK. We've got a couple of things going on here. And on the small screen, it's really hard to see right now. But what we actually have, and I'm going to have to move a couple things around for us to see everything I want to here. I have to close the console altogether. Come here. OK. We've got all the things that are actually happening on the timeline and that have happened in the course of 
us running that piece of code. We can turn them on and off, so we can tell it which we want, things that we want to see and the things we want to ignore. And we can zoom in on any of these things. Come here, I really want to show this part. It's not helping. We can see how much time was spent in scripting, rendering, painting, which is what we're doing. We can look at the call tree of everything that actually happened in the order it got called. An event log, which I won't go back in because of time right now, but remember earlier when I said that there's some other things like council.timer and time uh, timestamp? You can actually add log statements that'll appear in this view. So you can say things like, I started this, and you can search for it and find it in here so that you can help narrow yourself in. But we can go here and we can look. We're showing memory, and we can see that our heap memory is in blue. So as we're going and building our array there, uh, our memory is going up. If we were to uh, do this again, we could actually go and say, let's do this, and this will make it more fun. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we'll stop that. We should see some good memory usage happening at the moment. We can go and zoom in on any given layer and see what was actually happening in that period of time and dive into what was happening in terms of the number of nodes that existed and what our heap memory was doing at each of those times as we created things. Um, so this profiler is actually very, very cool in terms of like being able to understand over the course of time for your application what you actually saw. Now, on my last note, just because I made a bet, I didn't really make a bet, but I'm trying to make a bet that um, I was going to be done in time for 8 o'clock. Uh, we'll go to Google right quick, and we will uh, do something else here. Boy, it is really hard to navigate this with a trackpad and no space. But we will endure. All right, so let's go ahead and do this, and we're going to create this time with screenshots. And we will say we're going to search for test. And then we will search for foo. No, it was goo, that's close. Um, and now when we go through, not only can we see everything that happened, but do you see the screenshot that's showing up? We can actually see what the screen was looking like oh. at any given point in time as we were doing those things. So, that's so very cool. <laughs> You need a huge screen to do that. You do. Time. And, and well, normally I had to spread across three <laughs> monitors, right? You so like I'm I'm feeling like <laughs> yeah, feeling very claustrophobic on my laptop at the moment, because it's normally I've got each of these in a different panel. But yeah, so you can see everything that it did, all the rendering, every piece, because I've got it all turned on right now, that you can see and then every screenshot of where you were in the application when that happened. So given that summary view, yep. uh, I'm assuming those are all separate. Threads, which is why the view of the timeline is showing things overlapping. Yes. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. There definitely there's rendering that's happening at the same time as, as so, and you can think about it that way. You can actually see CPU time versus network traffic and everything on this graph. Okay. So I will leave it there for the moment at seven fifty nine. What is fifty three? No. No. Um, no. No. This is clearly a question. This is a question. A question. <laughs> clearly transitioned into questions. What, what is what is the band that's right above the blue graph there? This uh, the image. This one or that? Yeah, that one right there. That yeah. So that right now you're seeing images. So what you're seeing is that's the. Let me see if I can zoom it in for you. That's the screenshot during that time. Okay. I'm it's like, a summary like move the screen this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Which way? So like, well, just just the, the I guess is that do they they inserted the screenshot when the so those are just a screenshot inserted. In time those are screenshots right? inserted in the okay. timeline yeah. that are intended yeah. to line up when different events yeah. occur. Okay. And That's given all. what's yeah. showing up, it looks like the Google rendering engine is smart enough to only render what's within the viewport. Yes. That's cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's why you're getting the time a little bit. <laughs> it's lazy. It's like, hey, all good developers are. Um, all right, so yeah, so we can look, and again, it, this is a information overload, right, in terms of this, but it's really pretty interesting when we decide that we want to dive down into a given section and then maybe say, you know what, we don't actually need the document event, and we don't care about the number of nodes and listeners right now, uh, but we do want to care about the rest of it, um, and we can start getting summaries that are a little bit more appropriate to what we're trying to do. Um, and it's really tricky to move around that. Um, but yeah, uh, we can get a lot more information about what's going on. We can look at our memory growing um, as time happened here. And the number of nodes went along with the memory. The number of listeners, they went along with each one. If we were to do that same scenario, but then hop over to the memory tab and then 
GC. Yep. Because that memory growth, I'm wondering how much of that would eventually have been carbon. Yeah, carbon. and we can't tell from here, although you right. can GC from here. Oh, okay. So we could have GC before we, we did some things. So you can actually do that real time. So you can see that one drop in the heap, though. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yep, there's yeah, a, yeah, one yeah. pretty so good one right it here. must have done something. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, right around here after my first search, you see it, it the first drop happen. Um, and then it builds up, and then you see the next search. Um, where they're happening. But yeah, if we get down here, if I can, and I'm going to try really hard to get the right place with the right handle to move this. this I'm a answering question. a question. <laughs> he says angrily. All right. Was this like Jeopardy? Yeah. yeah. State that in the form of a question, please. There you go. So you can actually see some of what's happening, though, which is pretty interesting. Not only the function calls that you can dive into, and you can see which ones they are and what functions were called and what layer in the source they were. But you can see where it's recalculating styles and then the really cool one, if we find one here, let's see if we, yeah, XHR state changes. So we can actually see when data arrived, we can see uh, as it's compositing and as it's um, building pieces. Will the filter apply across any yes. of those? So if you look for XHR for filter, for example. There you go. There. Pretty nifty, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's really pretty pretty cool. And sometime we'll talk about, um, we'll do another one sometime, we'll just talk about painting and rendering and what that stuff means, because there's a whole level of optimization around there and what we can do. But it's really, you have to spend a little bit of time with it because there's an intense amount of information here. But it is so absolutely interesting in how much information you're basically being given for free with a tool set that's absolutely free um, to be able to look things because honestly having come from the world of like embedded and all these things you paid lots of money for these tools yeah. um, and, and this one's just free when you right click uh, which is pretty impressive is there a uh, like readily available uh, like help in prep to know what all of these there is like, okay now are. I'm gonna say yeah. there is but I'm gonna put three asterisks after it okay if you were to Google Chrome debugger tools, you will find a very, very useful set of help documents and tutorials on Google's site. They are at least 70% accurate. <laughs> um, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> that's better than a coin flip. It is better than a coin flip. Um, the deal is, is that these things change a lot. And in fact, um, where things can be found, the menus slightly seem to change over time. So the help docs are almost always slightly out of date. You can usually figure it out. But don't go there expecting that it's going to be accurate because you will be disappointed. Uh, but it will get you the gist of it. Uh, but yeah, there's about uh, 200 pages just on this screen uh, that you can go read if you want to. Random uh, question. Notice he said question. Uh, <laughs> if, if I'm using the fetch API instead of XML HTTP requests, yeah. will it show up as XHR? Yes. Okay. Just make sure yeah. that I'm not going to run into something. Uh, now you should see. Just, okay. You should see XHR. So um, there are times. There's actually a whole process by which it identifies too. So if something is actually an object, okay, it's a proper class. Yeah. It'll identify it by the name of the object. If something is in fact a function with properties and it's just a generic object, it will try and enumerate the top properties of the object as a way of telling you what it is. So it can, depending on how it's built, um, and this is one of the little tricks I actually use sometimes, and we didn't get to it today, but when I'm trying to hunt something down, sometimes I'll make a fake class, call it Bob for all I care, and in the code that you're trying to debug, yeah. instantiate a new Bob, uh, because you can search for that name anywhere in here. So if you make it something really long and obnoxious, uh, all you have to do is instantiate it in the code that you know is somehow retaining memory, Search for it, you'll find it right away, and then you just have to find out what's holding Bob in memory, and you can find out where your memory leak is. Is there any weirdness with uh, what worker threads? No, it's actually really clean. Cool. Uh, a little too, unfortunately. The, the and, error I mentioned. Can you differentiate? Earlier. Yeah, you can. One of the things I mentioned earlier is Firebase, unfortunately, for one of our projects, uh, I had used locally on 8080. And it is absolutely convinced every time it goes to 8080 now, it should be able to find the Firebase manifest to set up the worker thread. And I can't unconvince Chrome, no matter how hard I try, that it can't, that it will uh, not find Firebase at 8080, uh, will not find the Firebase scripts at 8080 again. So I have the, the errors muted at the moment, but if you were to actually go to my network tab, every one of these always shows a Firebase error at the top because it's trying to find it. So 
why don't you uninstall and reinstall? <laughs> well, I, the problem is I use 80. Have you tried turning it off and on? Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> um, I, the problem is I use 8080 for like any project. I'm always using the same port over and over again, and it's a different application. But it is convinced. It is convinced beyond all uh, all of the considerations that it's there. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Good. I hope everybody enjoyed it or at least got something out of it. Yes. Awesome. awesome. Thank you very much.